More now from eCancer Television with Professor Ken O'Byrne from Dublin. Um, Ken, you're looking at uh, molecular diagnosis and specifically the Lugano consensus. What would you say is the Lugano consensus on molecular diagnosis and its importance? Okay, I think um, it's important to go back a little bit in, in, in that process. Uh, the Lugano consensus really uh, emphasised the importance of the multidisciplinary team in optimising the care for the patient. And the area that I've looked at with uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, including Fiona Blackhall and uh, Raphael Rizal, is the specific role of, 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 of pathology in determining what the best treatment might be for a patient. And then within that, uh, molecular characteristics of the tumour that may allow us to personalise medicine. It would be great if in the future you could use molecular diagnosis uh, to really base the core of all personalised medicine. Do you think that is going to be possible? I do and I think there are some steps already that uh, are, we've made to, to make that happen. So uh, let's start off again on the kind of more simplistic basis. Um, we for many years ignored the importance of pathology, the histology. We thought that all non-small cell lung cancers were the same. Now we realise in fact that the treatment we might give to an adenocarcinoma or a non-squamous cancer, just simply chemotherapy, is somewhat different from the treatment we might favour giving to someone with a squamous cell cancer. And to, so the, one of the problems that we've had is that a lot of the biopsies that we get from patients, particularly with advanced disease, are very small. So we have to try, insofar as we can, subtype those tumours. So recent evidence has shown us that a marker called TTF1 uh, is a, and CK7 are good markers, and mucin stains are good markers for adenocarcinoma. Markers such as uh, CK56 and P63 uh, indicate that a tumour, which might you know, be difficult to tell just looking at a microscope, would favour a squamous cell cancer. That's quite useful. So that means that we can then, in more patients than we would have in the past, give a specific chemotherapy for adenos and specific chemotherapy for squamous. Now that's Chemotherapy, does the same thing apply to molecular therapy? Exactly. Now, the molecular therapies that we would use, um, some of them can be given in a, in a kind of a, a broad way. So, for example, Avastin, uh, Bevacizumab, which targets VEGF, and that's been shown to be a benefit for patients uh, who have um, non-squamous cancers. Okay, um, th th those, uh, those agents potentially are dangerous in squamous cell, so in they may have significant side effects. And we might use something else in squamous cell, so... Um, Although not licensed yet, the drug cetuximab looks like it might be interesting in squamous cell cancer as an additional treatment. It targets EGFR. But within both squamous cell, to a lesser extent, but adenocarcinoma and the non-squamous to a much larger extent, there's a subpopulation of patients who have mutations of the epidermal growth factor receptor. Ideally, we like to get that status at the beginning of the patient journey. And there are two, I think, big reasons for that. The first reason is the trial data that shows patients who get EGFR targeted therapies who've got mutations have a much higher response rate compared to chemo and have better quality of life for the time that they're on the targeted therapy than they are for the chemotherapy and they get prolonged survival which I think is very important. Um, and I think the, the, that, that conglomerate would tend to help us to use the EGFR uh, targeted therapy in the first line setting. What sort of time sequence are we talking about? Patient uh, presents, uh, uh, when, is, when do you start doing these molecular tests? Well, as soon as we establish the diagnosis. So it's really important that the small pieces of tissue that you get from these patients are used well. Um, what we would tend to do is look to the uh, H&E stain to look down, and if it's clearly an adenocarcinoma, um, and we're happy it's a lung cancer, then that's potentially enough. And then the rest of the tissue then can be used for your molecular testing. Okay. Um, in the uh, setting um, that uh, uh, you have uncertainty, then you just do a few small sections with the markers I told you, the TTF1, the CK56, et cetera. And then it's after that point that we then tend to do the molecular tests, okay? And what's interesting is that we're not just looking at EGFR mutations anymore. We've got EML for ALK translocations, and there's good evidence that if you target those drugs with the drug, or target that, um, those mutations in patients with a drug called crizotinib, that you may get a high response rate. We also have evidence that HER2 mutations, which are a small proportion of patients, they may benefit from HER2 targeted therapies, uh, perhaps Herceptin, perhaps Herlipatinib, perhaps one of the newer agents that's coming through, such as BIBW2992, which is a, a, an irreversible binder 
to EGFR, but also binds to HER2. So it's, it, this is the way we're moving forward. So eventually we'll be able to actually personalize targeted therapies to subsets of patients. And then obviously there'll be a cohort of patients for whom there isn't a target and they would be maybe preferentially started on chemotherapy. We're moving forwards, but have we got there? Is the decision-making process clear-cut yet? The, the, the decision-making process is becoming more clear-cut. And, and by that I mean, um, compared to, for example, when I started off you know, over 20 years ago looking after patients, we were still unsure about even the value of chemotherapy. Then we had a meta-analysis in 1995 which suggests that cisplatin in patients with advanced disease added six weeks survival, but with a lot of toxicity. Then we got data showing that chemotherapy versus best supportive care actually not only had survival benefits, but improved symptoms, quality of life. Then we began to look at second-line chemotherapy only in the last decade, showing an improvement in survival. Then we had the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, erlotinib, coming in in second line, showing a benefit. Then we've moved on to the histologies, again showing small benefits, small gains. And then we've got maintenance therapies, both with pemetrexid uh, and erlotinib in particular, targeted and non-targeted, but also things like uh, uh, gemcitabine, et cetera, may have a benefit. So we're moving forward slowly but surely and we're getting incremental benefits in terms of survival for the patient. And those, those benefits of survival are, are linked on to quality of life and symptom control benefits. Now, which of the markers are strongly linked with um, uh, prognosis and predicting the course of the disease so far? Which have already made it, so to, so to speak? Yeah, the, the, the only, so um, I just want to distinguish between prognosis and prediction. So prognosis is a marker that tells you that the patients will do well or badly, irrespective of any treatment you give. But a predictive marker tells you that that patient's likely to benefit from a treatment or likely to be resistant to a treatment. So it's really the predictive marker, the nailed predictive marker is the EGFR mutation. EGFR, what about the others uh, waiting in the sidelines? eml 4 alk is I think the next big one that's going to come through. Um, uh, the data, early data show that those patients have a very high response rate to uh, crizotinib. I think the other uh, um, uh, targets that are coming through, as I mentioned, I've mentioned HER2 uh, mutations. Um, Metmab, so the Metmab is a, an antibody, um, and there's also a, a, a TKI that switches off uh, Met, CMET. So I think that's going to be a big target that comes through. And then in, in another group of patients, we've got PARP inhibition. I think that look, looks very exciting. The PARP inhibitors may work, and again, in a subset of patients, that we ha have a, a characteristic called brackenness. They, they have uh, deficiencies in DNA repair. We think that's going to be very, very important. What about good old standard chemotherapy? Are there any of your markers which can help you choose which agent to use? There are potentially markers, but none of them have yet, to be, have yet been proven in randomized controlled trials. So probably one of the markers that's been most talked about is ERCC1. Uh, this is a DNA repair enzyme that if it's overexpressed appears to uh, give resistance to cisplatin-based chemotherapy, cisplatin-based chemotherapy in particular. Um, but again, we don't have randomized control trial data, prospective data, to really nail that one. And I think in chemotherapy, it's a little bit behind, even though the, 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 the knowledge base is it was a bit ahead of the targeted therapies, it, it's a little bit behind where the targeted therapies are in redefining who does and does not get a benefit from specific therapies. But that, there are a lot of trials ongoing in this area and we will get prospective data over the next few years. And with the predictive markers, how much do you predict they will improve therapy if you get them all right? Okay, so let's take EGFR, a very simple one. Um, the response rate to chemotherapy for um, patients uh, with squamous or adenocarcinomas is between 20 and 30 percent. That's, that's the objective for shrink, shrink rate. And by that, that, I mean the tumour shrinks by more than 50% in those patients. About another 40 to 50% of patients, the disease is stable, and the next 30 to 40% of the patients progress with chemotherapy. With the EGFR targeted therapies, the response rate goes up between 70 and 80%. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big difference. A massive difference. And uh, we also know that that subset of patients, they probably respond a little bit better to chemotherapy, maybe up to about 40% with chemotherapy. So that's a big, big step forward. And um, with the crizotinib uh, therapy I mentioned with eml 4 alk the response rate again looks like it's about 70%. So these targeted therapies given to patients who've got these mutations work very, very well. They're relatively, relatively free of side effects, and free of the chemotherapy side effects like nausea, vomiting. Um, so I, I think this is, this is going to be the future. This is where we're going with the personalized medicine approach. So you're predicting uh, potentially a sea change in the results of therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. Absolutely. I think we're going to see a, 
I'm very, very positive now about the future. I think it was interesting because I was involved in a lot of the early trials of targeted therapies with chemotherapy that were all negative, and we were all saying, God, is a, is a targeted agent actually going to work? And part of the reason they were negative is because we weren't quite sure that we were hitting the target. In other words, we weren't sure if the tumour actually had the target or not. Now, with molecular diagnostics coming through, we know we can tell in many cases that the target's present, and that group of patients does very well. Now, you've been given the difficult job of saying what is the consensus from Lugano mm. on pathology and molecular testing. Clearly, we don't yet have all the data, so what's your version for the, uh, the, the take-home message for what the consensus is on the knowledge so far? I think the two big uh, points that we would make is that it's really important to try and distinguish between squamous cell carcinomas and non-squamous because that affects the chemotherapy we might give. The second consensus is that we're saying that we really should try to test for EGFR mutation status in every patient before they go on to have either chemotherapy or the target EGFR TKI, particularly in the non-squamous, which tends to be where the bulk of the EGFR mutators patients are. And the third consensus point I think that we're making now is that we believe EML4 ALK will be a target and that really labs should now be gearing themselves up, molecular diagnostic labs, to begin to uh, optimise their testing for this on the basis that we think it's likely that that's going to become an established target for therapy really within the next few months. Mm. It all sounds very exciting. Yes. Ken, thank you for being on eCancer TV. Pleasure. Thank you.